All right. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. I just heard someone say we love our mat because obviously you all were expecting Mike tonight. I have a mat that was left at my house when I first came here. It said welcome mat on it and it's a, a door mat. <laughs> so I love my mat too. Whoever thought of that, I think it was Pam, I'm not sure. <laughs> I still love my mat. Well, I'm glad to be here tonight. Thank you for coming everybody. Um, we're gonna tackle a, a tough question uh, today. Uh, but first we'll open with prayer and uh, we gave Mike the night off. I hope you're okay with that. Uh, you're stuck with little old me today. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm truly humbled by that. Save your applause till after. Uh, it, may, it may happen. It may not. We'll see. Well, let's open with prayer. Well, good and gracious God, we thank you so much for another beautiful evening, another day on your great creation. And Lord, we come to this place in the midst of a busy life, busy schedules, Lord, and chaos, trouble that ensues all around us. And so, Lord, we ask for your peace now. We ask for your wisdom and we ask for your spirit. But most of all, we trust you that this too shall pass. And one day we will see you face to face with our Lord and Savior. We thank you. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. So, uh, as you, many of you probably know, uh, who've been watching online or attending services, we've been going through a series on evangelism and how to surprise the world, and we've been talking about the five missional habits of bless, eat people, not eat people, eat with people, <laughs> um, listen, learn, and send. And uh, it got me kind of thinking today as I was preparing for the lesson is, you know, what is some of the biggest challenges we do face with evangelism? And I know the whole idea of the sermon series is we don't necessarily have to use words, but I think it's also true that at some point in our, our lives with people, we will be faced with questions. And that's ultimately what we want, is people to ask us questions about our faith and our relationship with Jesus. So the most popular question, uh, the most common question I get is why do good things, or excuse me, bad things happen to good people? And I'm sure you all have heard that too. And so uh, I'll just start by saying that I don't have a complete answer. I don't. Um, so today I ask for your grace <laughs> um, and in that, and I hope to really walk with you in this journey and in, in trying to discover um, God's will in this for us. And so um, this is not a one hour topic. This is not a two hour topic. This is something you can explore a, a lifetime and maybe still not have all the questions answered and, and people who are much, much brighter than I have uh, tried to tackle it. And I'll talk about some of them tonight as well. And there's many of you who I would love to hear from as well. If you uh, disagree with me tonight, or if there's other questions that you have, or maybe a way that you have tackled or heard this um, question tackled before, feel free to shoot me an email. I'd, I'd love to read it. Honestly, I would. Um, but with no further ado, let's go ahead and, and dig in. So the scripture reading I chose for this topic comes from Matthew 13. It's the parable of the, the wheat and the tares, or the wheat and the weeds, sometimes it's called. It's Matthew 13, verses 24 through 29. So I'm going to go ahead and read it. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, 
First collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. This is the word of God for the people of God. Be God. Amen. So, a couple things about this parable. Oftentimes, um, you know, people may not think of this parable as something to do with the, the issue of evil in the world. Most people probably somewhere in their um, upbringing have learned that this parable is about the church and about bad people in the church. Has anyone heard that interpretation or is it just me? It could just be me. I came from a very conservative Southern Baptist kind of upbringing. Um, uh, so I heard, I heard that interpretation a lot and I've, I've heard it a few times. But even if it's not about the church, you often kind of read this and you think, okay, well, what are the weeds? Um, and I often hear people say, well, the weeds are, are bad people. Well, really, there's, there's two misconceptions uh, with that interpretation. Um, I, I do not think that's what Jesus is talking about um, for a couple of reasons. One, it starts off as the kingdom of heaven is like a man. And I think that's why people automatically think of the church, because some folks refer to the church as the kingdom of God, uh, that we are the kingdom, that the kingdom is eternal and it, it lives within us, and that's true, uh, but that's not the only way the scripture talks about the kingdom of God. So when Matthew talks about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, and you could read a lot more about that in, in Matthew 13, there's all kinds of stuff about the kingdom. It's actually talking about the universal reign and rule of God. Um, so Christ, one of the first messages he preached is the kingdom of heaven is at hand or nearby. Repent and believe, right? That was one of the first uh, sermons, many sermons of Jesus. He also went around proclaiming the kingdom of God. And in fact, that's what he instructs his disciples to do in Matthew is to go out and proclaim the kingdom of God. So the kingdom, they're not proclaiming the church. It's not the church is right here. Turn and repent. You know, it's, it's the, the kingdom of God, the universal reign and rule of God Almighty, the creator of the universe is present in the person of Christ. That's the good news of the kingdom, that everything that God is about, his love, his justice, his peace, that we're all waiting for, is, has come close in the person of Jesus. So that's, that's one um, thing we need to wrap our minds around. Cause this parable is about the kingdom, and the kingdom is about uh, God's presence being made known in Christ. Okay? Second thing, I think the, the other um, issue we often have with interpreting this parable is we immediately go to the seed, and we think of the seed is people. So it says, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in the field. So a lot of people go, oh, well, good seed, bad seed, because of the parable before this, that we think, oh, this is about people. Have you ever heard a person uh, called to as a, a bad seed? Maybe your parents called someone a bad seed. You know, don't hang out with them. They're a bad seed. Um, so that's actually, again, kind of a misconception of these texts. So if you actually read, and I'm not going to go back and read it for the sake of time, uh, but if you go back and read the parable right before this, it's the parable of the farmer who's scattering the seed. Jesus says that the seed is the word of God is scattering the word of God, and the soil that it lands on is, is the disciples or is, is the people. So some of it falls on hard soil or rocky soil. Some of it falls on good soil. Um, some of it um, has weeds that grow up along with it and choke out the word of God, the seed. So kingdom of God is about the universal reign and rule of Christ. The seed in this parable is not people. It's it's, um, it's the word of God. And so it's interesting then, if we look again and kind of read it through that lens, so now we know what Jesus is talking about, uh, we can see that, okay, this is not just about the church. It's not just about bad people and good people. It's, the, it's about the whole world. And the fact that in the world, there are good things, but there are also bad things. There are weeds. So... 
that's uh, lesson number one, just to kind of give some context. So here we are at the problem of evil and this parable and how Jesus addresses it. Uh, this is all often being called the impossible chess game uh, for theologians. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to look at it like a chess game a little bit, and we're going to kind of address, hopefully in a logical way, um, how this chess game is set up. So when you hear the question, why do bad things happen to good people? We have to realize that that question itself is already rigged. It's set up. Um, that chess game is already rigged from the beginning. It's kind of like the question, if God is all powerful, can God create a rock that is too big for God to move? You know, some of you are laughing and shaking your heads because you've thought about this before. Maybe someone's asked you this before. It's a loaded question. Obviously, God can't create a rock that is so big that he can't move it because it's impossible, right? If he creates a bigger rock, and he, of course he can still move it because he's God. So he has to create a bigger rock, so, oh wait, he's, but he can't move it. So he's got to create a bit. It's just an endless logic cycle that you get stuck in. It's, it's, there's no answer to the question because the question itself is loaded. And so uh, the, the problem with evil, why do bad things happen to good people? Let's just, for a second, examine the question and what the question already assumes when people ask it. So first off, I'd like us to notice that people are more willing to accept that bad things happen to bad people than good things, or excuse me, than bad things happening to good people. Um, so right away, uh, in our humanness, in our sense of justice, it's, we, we assume that it's better, kind of in our um, justice or, or karma, I don't like to use that word, but we kind of have this karma system of thinking, okay, if I do good things, then good things should happen to me. Or is if somebody does bad things, then bad things should happen to them. That's human logic, <laughs> right off the bat. Um, Romans 9.15, and elsewhere in the Bible too, it says, God has mercy whom God is ha gonna have mercy on, and God shows compassion to whoever God chooses. So plain and simple, the rain falls on the good people, and the rain falls on the bad people. God makes that decision, not us. So that's very important. Two, second problem. What else are they assuming in that question? I'll ask you all. Why do bad things happen to good people? That there are good people. That there are good people. Good. Some of you are paying attention, because I've heard Mike say it before. Uh, yeah, that there are good people. And really, as a, as a Christian standpoint, this is something we don't like to talk about anymore, because it hurts our feelings, it hurts our pride. Um, but... Scripture teaches that none are righteous, no, not one, right? That we all have fallen short of the glory of God. And that is a hard pill to swallow. Uh, it is humbling, and it is something that rubs up, up against us the wrong way. But that is the truth of Scripture. Um, and there, there is a, a theologian who once said, you know, if you don't believe that humans are evil, then you obviously don't know yourself very well. <laughs> so that's, that's all I've got to say about that. But what Jesus said about it is that um, uh, a rich man approached him and, and was asking a question about the kingdom of heaven. He said, how do I get in to this kingdom? And he said, good teacher, what must I do? And Jesus' response was not first to answer his question. It first was to to, to address the problems with his question, which is, why do you call me good? You're making an assumption within that question. And Jesus said, no one is good but God. Um, so right away, when, when people say, why do bad things happen to good people? We have to stop and say, wait a minute. Why do you assume that people are good? <laughs> and so... so there's two problems, at least, with that question. There's a whole host of other things we could talk about there. Um, but I, want to, um, I wanted to inform you that and start it there just to let you know that that question 
as it is stated so often, has issues with it in and of itself from a, a Christian world view. Um, so oftentimes, you can't just answer that question. You have to actually say, wait a minute, we ha we're making some assumptions with that question. Let's, let's address those assumptions so that me and you can talk on the same page, make sure we're, we're together. So um, here's, uh, here's the next. So, so if those are bad questions, if those are bad questions, what are some better questions that we can ask when addressing the problem of evil? Because what it boils down to, what those folks are asking, what we ask uh, when we doubt, is what is God's relationship to evil? That's what we really want to know, is how does God respond to my suffering? Is God just aloof? Is he unaware? Is he in the midst of it? Is he working for our good? Is he addressing the problem of evil? You know, what is God's relationship to the suffering and evil I see in the world? That's actually what's at the heart of the issue. So, so what, are some, what are three questions that scripture gives us and answers in this parable? So one is that does evil come from God? That's the first question. Let's look at the parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, so they asked the question, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? So there's the first question that scripture gives us and scripture answers. And that is, where, where did evil come from? Where, where is all this suffering we see? If God is good and the master of the vineyard is good, why do I look around and see all this suffering? And... Uh, the, the owner replies, an enemy did this. That is the, is the, the answer that we are given in scripture. Um, I'll just say that it is not popular in today's day and age to believe in a cosmic force of evil. Um, and scripture uh, is often referred to as Satan or Satan or the devil or the evil one. Um, but it is clear that when Jesus walked this earth, um, that he referred to someone or something as the evil one um, or the enemy, right? The enemy of our souls. So that is, I, I don't think that is addressed enough in the church today or just in life in general. Um, but that is something that Jesus taught, and I believe that this parable teaches that there is evil in the world. There is uh, chaos, there is an enemy, there is something that is not good, that is out there, that is working uh, for evil and chaos. However, I, I am not one to believe that the devil is behind every rock. So every time I stub my toe, I, I don't think that the devil did that. That's just me, uh, you don't have to agree with me on that, but that, that's where I am theologically. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for suffering out there. Uh, one is our own sin. Uh, Augustine was really the, the hero, the saint um, that addressed that properly and said, you know, he, he really believed that, that evil came from our free will, that, that all of it stemmed from our free will, um, and that sometimes our sin has consequences all the time, really. So that's a, a whole nother tangent for the sake of time. Again, I'm not gonna go fully down that rabbit hole, but just to say that we have to at least recognize or raise the question, who is the enemy and, and what role does that play in the world today? Um, I think it's one that, that Jesus um, answers, I think it's one that, that Jesus talks about, and I think that it is um, unique in some ways to the Christian worldview. A lot of people would stop you right there and say, well, I don't, I don't believe in that. I don't believe in demonic powers or whatever. 
Um, and, and then it's, okay, well, this is back to scripture, right? This is what I see in scripture, and this is what I believe. Um, so again, if you want to talk more about that, email me, because again, I, I'm not saying that the devil's behind every uh, bad thing in your life, um, and is, he's not behind every bad thing in the world, but I am saying that, that there is a, a cosmic force out there that is evil, that is acting against good, and I think we have to, to recognize that, um, as Jesus does. So, the enemy did this, he replied. So, the, the other two things that we can immediately say, even if we can't get all of our questions answered around the, where does evil come from, it is safe to say that it has not come from God. We can all agree on that, right? So that is the good news, is that when people often ask that question, what they're wanting to know, is God good? Does God care about me? Yeah, go ahead. Mm. Because certainly trials can come from God. Yeah. God can allow the devil or Satan, the accuser, to do things. But ultimately, God set Adam in the garden and he had him do work. Well, you might think that, you know, pulling up weeds or trimming bushes is a bad thing. Or if you, if you do it wrong and it falls upon you, you might think that's a bad thing, but it came from not a bad place. Right. Before Adam fell from grace, before Eve came along, he still may have had some quote-unquote bad things happen. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, so just going to repeat it, hopefully summarize it if I can, uh, so that everyone can hear, is that um, evil does, or suffering so there's a distinction between evil and suffering, and not all suffering is evil. Um, so working out, I, I don't go to the gym often, but when I do, it feels like suffering. <laughs> it is painful, it is, it is a, a lot of work uh, if you're doing it right, uh, but ultimately, it's not evil. Uh, the suffering is leading to good, right? It's leading to the betterment of my health or, or physical shape, uh, those types of things. So, so yes, uh, a man named Hicks uh, was kind of the first person to articulate that in a, in a modern way. Uh, he said that basically all suffering that we experience is building you up in some way. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger, essentially, to put it in the words of Taylor Swift. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, that is one aspect. That is one aspect. All I can say really there is I agree with you, and we may touch on that at the end, um, but I can, my limited mind, and from what I've read, I know there's at least seven reasons for, for suffering. Um, so it is important to make the distinction between suffering and evil. Um, but I think, again, just staying close to the text for today and you know, just really just putting a box around the problem for now just for the sake of tonight and time is, is evil. Uh, what is the problem with evil? Why, you know, why, are, why do evil things, you know, not just suffering, but why do evil things happen to good people um, is kind of the framework that we're working in. But thank you. That is a very good point and a helpful clarification. Yes? Uh, not to get you off track here, but yeah. Jesus does explain the parable a little later in the chapter. Ooh, good. Let's, yeah, let's pause there. And um, yes, 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 he does. And I encourage you all to read it. Yeah, we have a pretty good authority what he's talking about. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, okay. Okay, so that's the first question. What is God's relationship to evil? Does evil come from God? We can safely say that Scripture and Jesus say no, that God is good, evil occurs outside of God. It, it does not stem from God. That is good news. That is the gospel um, in and of itself. Second question that we get in this parable that we can safely answer tonight Immediately, when the, the servants, they hear an enemy did this, what do they immediately want to do? 
pull it out. They want to start going out there and yanking out the weeds themselves. And isn't that such like us humans to immediately want to try to fix the problem ourselves? And um, that is something uh, that we can ask tonight is, are we supposed to fix it? Are we supposed to fix it? I hear yes and no. Eventually. Eventually. Is it up to us to fix it? Maybe I should ask it that way. If God wants us to. All right. It seemed to be some mixed. I don't know. I got to go back to the parable. Let's see. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. Is that hard for you all? <laughs> it's hard for me because I'm a fixer. I think being a pastor, uh, I want to I fix the problem of evil in this world. If someone comes to me in my office and says, Matt, I have this problem, I want to go and, and do something about it. If someone says, uh, you know, my water heater's broken, I want to, let's go, let's go fix it. Let's see what the problem is, right? My car's not running. I want to go and fix it. Go ahead. Well, I'd like to ask you, aren't you responsible for doing the footwork? Mm. God is in the lead. Mm. I put him ahead of myself, mm -hmm. and I pray every day that he will show me the answers. Yeah. But in the meantime, I don't think I belong in the basement. Mm. I think I belong out there doing the footwork that I can do as yeah. an imperfect human being yeah. and hoping that I will be led to... Yeah, and isn't it so good that God does invite us on the journey of the kingdom? You know, that he, he calls us, uh, you know, co-workers in the kingdom, that, that we are to, to, to help the poor and to feed the, the hungry and, and things like that. So, uh, yeah, I, I, so I agree with you all. I'm playing devil's advocate a little bit just to make you all think a little bit. But, yeah, I think there are some things we can do, right? You know, I'm pretty sure that, you know, helping the, the homeless person, uh, you know, that, that sits at the corner of, of the Publix every day, you know, is, is a good, good thing, right? I know that there are some good things that I can do for the most part, but I think the warning is here, again, is that, is that we don't have the wisdom. So kind of what you said is that, you know, I pray and, and hope that God gives me the wisdom and with his guiding, you know, I, I, can, I can do some good, hopefully. Um, but yeah, yeah. And isn't that what the servant is doing when he says, do you want us to go and pull them up? Lord, where did this come from? Yeah. And he's asking for guidance because that servant doesn't know. Yeah. And that's where he's getting the advice from the, okay. from the one who yeah. doesn't know. Yeah, that's good. Um, so the, the comment was, you know, isn't, isn't that where the servant's getting the guidance to, to pull up the weeds as they're, they're talking to the master about, okay, well, how do we go about this? And, and you're right. I think they are. They're, they're, they're saying, all right, I see all this evil. What can we do about it? Um, is there anything we can do about it? Um, and I think the, the answer is yes, yes and no, um, you know, but, but we have to be, but we have to be careful, right? Um, and the problem being that, a lot of times what may look like a weed to us is really a wheat. So let me give you an example in my life. So kind of back to um, what we were talking about with the issue of suffering not always being evil. Sometimes we don't know the difference. Sometimes what we think might look like evil is really uh, just God working something out, right? Something in our lives that he's going to turn around for a greater good. Um, so when I uh, was preparing to go to college, I wanted to go to a Christian school. I knew at that point I'd been called to the ministry. And so I was all lined up to go to uh, a local college in Lakeland. Um, I thought that was God's will for my life. So I went there and they sat me down. It was like the first first or second day I got there. I remember I spent the night there, two nights there. Went to the financial aid office and I said, okay, well, how much are my, my Florida Bright Future scholarship, how much is that gonna cover? Because if it's a public university, it was gonna cover pretty much all of the tuition. Uh, but this was a private school and so they had to calculate what it was gonna cover. Well, long story short, it was gonna cover a minuscule amount. <laughs> um, and they said, this is what you're gonna owe. 
you know, here's your room and board, here's your meal plan, here's your books, here's your tuition, yada, yada, yada. And uh, I looked at it and it was more money than I had ever, you know, seen in my life. I was like, how am I going to do this? Um, I was like, I don't believe that God wants me to be this much in debt, but I also feel like God's calling me to go here. And so it was this, you know, conflict in my, in my heart and in my mind. And so I took some time to pray about it. And if I would have had it my way, I would have had that scholarship go through. I would have said, you know, it's going to be a full ride. I'm going to be paid for. I'm going to go to that school. I'm going to get my degree and what I want to get it in. And the rest is history. That's not what happened. Uh, I, was, I was very upset, but I decided to take a, a semester off because I didn't feel like I could afford it. Um, and I worked full time and discerned where the Lord was really wanting me to go. And that was a hard semester for me. I really did not want to stop going to school at that time. I felt like my friends were surpassing me in their education, that I was somehow falling behind. Um, well, long story short, uh, the University of South Florida opened up a campus in Northport. I don't know if any of you remember that. They only opened it for about three years um, and then closed it down again. But it was during, it was that, that, it wasn't open when I stopped going to school, but when I went back in the fall, they had opened that new campus up with the degree I wanted and I was able to use my, my full scholarship uh, to cover tuition. And, and really that was a, a God thing. Um, and there's other stuff like that in my life. I'm sure you have stories like that too. And if I had more time, I'd have you share them all. Um, but you know, not all suffering is evil. It, and, and we cannot decide which is which often. We get to that place, that fork in the road, and a lot of us would choose not to go through that if it was up to us. Uh, but when we leave it up to God and he walks with us through it, sometimes we realize we went through that for a reason and it was for a greater good and it was for God's glory. Um, and that's all over scripture. Um, I mean, think about Lazarus, right? Mary and Martha want Jesus to come and heal Lazarus while he's still sick before he's died and Jesus doesn't come. Jesus knew he was gonna die. He knew he was uh, that sick and um, he doesn't come. And when finally Jesus showed up, Lazarus is in the tomb, he's dead four days. And the sisters go, why, Jesus? Why weren't you here sooner? If they, if they would have had it their way, Lazarus would have never died in the first place. But because it was for God's glory, the scripture says, that he, he calls Lazarus out of the tomb. And Lazarus gets to experience the full power of, of the resurrected Christ, really, in that moment. And uh, he, not only that, he can go tell everybody what Jesus did for him. And I, I guarantee if you asked Mary and Martha and Lazarus afterwards, they would have said, yes, that was bad, but this was better. Um, so think about Joseph again. Uh, you know, he's sold to slave, a coat of many colors, right? He makes his brothers jealous. He's sold into slavery. He goes into prison um, for many years. Eventually... Uh, he gets to be at the right hand of Pharaoh and his brothers come back because there's a famine and they go to Egypt and they come back to him and say, hey, uh, we need food. And after he reveals himself, you know, as, as their long lost brother, he, he says, don't worry about it. All is forgiven. You know, he says, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. Um, so that, that is the hope um, that we have is that there's a lot of suffering, there's a lot of evil we, we face. Um, we can't always fix it because we can't always discern what is actually evil and what is actually being worked out for our good. Um, so that's an important question, an important answer that this parable does. And then uh, we'll move to the final question and I, I'm gonna do my best to leave plenty of time for questions because I know there's gonna be a lot. Um, but the last question that this parable brings up and it helps us answer is, okay, well, if we're not to fix it, and we're to leave it up to God in some ways, and God's going to fix it, right? He says that the, the harvesters are gonna come, they're gonna collect the weeds, they're gonna tie them in bundles to be burned, and then God's gonna collect the wheat and bring it into the barn. Okay, so why not now? 
God, if you're going to fix this, why not now? Go ahead. The parable is interesting in that it picks wheat and tares, and if you watch them grow together, they look identical mm. until the heads are pulled. It's only when the heads are pulled that you can distinguish the two. Yeah, that is really interesting. I think that is definitely Jesus knows that, and that's part of what he's talking about. And thank you for bringing it up, because I uh, forgot to mention that. So the comment was, wheat and uh, tares, specifically, there's a certain type of weed that grows up with weeds. I'm not a farmer, uh, and I grew up in Florida, so I don't have a good concept of this like some of you might. Um, but if you've been around wheat, you'll know this, that the wheat and the tares look identical until they come to uh, full fruition. And then, uh, then you can tell the, the difference by their fruit, essentially. Yes? Man, I think the name of that weed is Darnell. Thank you. It is Darnell. Thank you. If you all want to Google it. It's nasty stuff, right? Right. And it doesn't produce anything of value. So it's just like us full of sin, not knowing Christ. We don't produce for Christ. We produce for God. But where the wheat actually produces a value of product, that's the difference of the wheat from the tares. I'm an old farm gal, so. Yeah, see, I knew, I knew there had to be someone in here with that knowledge. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. Yeah. So will it always be this way? is our final question. And the answer is no. Yes? Everything in God's time. Everything in God's time. There is a time for everything and a season under God. Yes, there is a time for everything. It's Ecclesiastes, right? Oh, very good. Very good. That, they're setting me up for a home run. Uh, they're saying there's a time for everything and, and God's giving a chance to people. And, and that is truly the best answer that I have found in scripture to, one, will it always be this way? God safely says, no, there is coming a day when the wheat and weeds are going to be separated and the evil in this world is going to be destroyed completely. And that is the good news that Christians have. Why not now? That is a question that all of us face. And, um, we heard it. Uh, God's given people a chance. Turn with me, if you would, to 2 Peter 3, and it is verses 6 through 9, and then I'm just going to read 13 as well. But there's, um, there's a lot in there, so I'm just going to read, read a little bit. 2 Peter 3, 6. And really, um, yeah, you could even start before that uh, with verse 3 when it talks about in the last days there's going to be scoffers. There's going to be qu people that question whether God's going to come back. Uh, but I'm going to start in, in verse 6. By these waters also the world of that time was del deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance." And then he says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. I'm going to jump down to verse 13. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. So that's the hope. That's the hope. Uh, again, evil's going to be completely destroyed, and there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness and love and goodness reign. Um, and Jesus himself is going to wipe away every tear from our eye. The why not now? God is patient. He is slow to anger. He's abundant in steadfast love. And so, you know, oftentimes when people ask that question, well, why not now? Does God see me now? Because we have to remember behind that question is a questioner and they are, they're suffering just like we all are. They have their own struggle, struggles. And uh, what they really want to know is, God, uh, does God see me, and is he doing something about it, or is, or is God not there? 
um, and we can safely answer, yes, he sees you, he is good, this will only last for a time, and why doesn't he do it now? It's not because God is evil, it's not because he's not kind, it's actually because he's incredibly compassionate, and he's waiting for every person to know him. Question in the back, Dan. This parable and the passage in, in Peter are really uh, talk about end times. Yeah. Uh, and I think it would be, I think it's too easy to conflate that. We can't change what's going to take place in the end of time. Mm -hmm. But Jude talks clearly about dealing with evil in the church in the present time. And so I think it's important to make a distinction between what God's plan is for us to determine events for the end of time and, and to miss the point that we, are, we, we do have a responsibility to de deal with evil today. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dan. So Dan brought up uh, what we were talking about a little earlier in that, what is our responsibility in this? Um, and the, in Jude, um, it's talked about that we are to deal with evil in the church and in the world. Um, but in, in this scripture, in the, the parable of the wheat and the weeds, and also in Second Peter, the focus is more uh, eschatological or on the end times. So, yes, that's, you're, you're correct, Dan. Um, that is part of the beauty of scripture and the tension a lot of times um, where we have to hold things together and say, yes, this is true in some cases, um, but over here, uh, it works a little different. Um, kind of like what we say, okay, well, by faith, we're saved, right? And then over in James, James says, well, uh, faith without works is dead. And they aren't contradictory, but they, they work together in some ways. It's a, it's a both and. And so I think it's the same here is that, um, you know, I think Jesus is making a strong point um, that a lot of times we can't discern what is, is, is evil and, and what is uh, something that may turn out actually to be a blessing um, or in some ways good. Um, and so we have to be careful not to immediately say, well, this thing that's happening to me is not God's will, um, right? So, but yes, Dan, I, I, I also agree with you that, that we're not supposed to just sit back and you know, just hands off kind of approach to life. We're supposed to actively work for, for good in the world. Yeah, definitely. Um, so that is the three questions and I'll just recap them, make one final point, and then I'll save about 10 minutes, a little over 10 minutes, hopefully, for questions. So the questions that we can uh, safely assume. So one uh, is, well, let's say, let's, sorry, backtrack. So a bad question. <laughs> the bad question you always hear is, why do bad things happen to good people? Um, so we have to be careful with that question and say, okay, well, one, uh, uh, we kind of have this um, karmic system in our minds that bad things happen to bad people or should happen to bad people and that good things should happen to good people when in reality uh, it's all up to God and God shows mercy who he's going to show mercy on and he shows mercy to bad people uh, thanks be to God um, because the truth of it is, is, is none of us are good people uh, we all need God's grace. If God dealt with us like we deserve, uh, we would not be here today. <laughs> um, so one, no, that's a bad question. Three better questions. Does evil come from God? No. Scripture clearly says God is good. The evil that we see in the world did not come from God. We can safely say that. Uh, two, what do we do about it? Well, we've heard a little bit discussion, um, but at least in this parable, it seems like we are not the fixers. God is the fixer. Um, and that is primary because we don't have the wisdom to discern a lot of times between 
uh, what, is, what is good and what is evil. Now there are some things, again, that clearly we can work for good in this world, and I agree that there's places in scripture uh, that call us to action that we should work for good. Um, again, feeding the hungry, healing the sick, um, you know, there, there's a lot of good we can do in this world and, and a lot of uh, justice we can, we can do, and God calls us to do that. And then the final question, okay, is well, if, if God is gonna fix it, when is he gonna do it? Is it always gonna be like this? And, and the Christian response, the good news is no. One day, God is gonna return and he is gonna make all things right. Love, peace, and justice are going to reign, all evil, all suffering is going to be destroyed, and every pain you've ever felt is going to be held in the arms of Jesus, and he's going to take that pain from us and completely restore it. I can't tell you exactly how that's going to happen, but I know that it's going to happen. And I can't tell you when it's going to happen, but I can tell you that, that it is going to be in God's perfect timing. And the reason he's waiting is not because uh, he's, he's toying around with us or he's not paying attention. Uh, it's because God is patient and he's waiting for everyone to turn to him. So I'll leave you with this final thought. You know, Jesus, um, he confirms this. In John 16, uh, verse 33, uh, he says to his disciples, and this is uh, close to his death, he says, in this world, there will be trouble. Jesus knew trouble. He, he <laughs> knew every human trouble. Um, he experienced all kinds of suffering. He lost all his friends. Uh, his, his parents uh, were persecuted. Uh, they thought that he was out of wedlock. I mean, uh, he was the object of derision. Uh, they, they tried to kill him. Uh, they eventually killed him. Um, he was tortured um, for our sins. Uh, he went down to hell to get the, the keys back for us. Um, he experienced excruciating pain. And, and on the cross, uh, he cries out, you know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, and a lot of people, a lot of theologians believe that at that moment when he said that, he was experiencing what it meant to be separated from God. That he experienced the full weight of sin on that, in that moment. The sin of the world, the sin, our sin was cast on his shoulders. And he felt the pain and the consequences and the weight of all of that junk. And at that moment, he felt completely separated from God. And so in this world, he says, you will have troubles. <laughs> Jesus knew that better than any of us. His disciples, Paul, knew that better than any of us. But then he says, so that, that's our common lot. You know, when, when people come to us um, with this question, it's, it's something we all face in this world, we have troubles, non-Christians and Christians. That's our common lot. We get to add on the little line after that, that Jesus says in John 16, 33, in this world, you will have troubles, but take heart, I have overcome the world. That's the good news, that all who believe in him, uh, the gates of hell will not prevail. That one day, we know that Jesus is coming back to take his children home. And I know that that may, to a lot of people, not answer all the questions. To a lot of folks, um, I'm gonna hear, and, and, I, and I know, because I've heard it before, is that doesn't help me now. Uh, the suffering that I'm experiencing is too great, I just want it to stop. And, and I hear you, and I don't have all the answers for that. All I can say is that, that God loves you, and he is going to make all things right. He will restore that, and he will heal that pain someday. All right, thanks be to God. That's all I've got for you um, for the lesson, but I want to open it up to questions. So first one I saw, yeah. Life is a matter of trials 
to overcome and troubles cause us to turn to God to be with us but I, I believe we all have trials it's another word for bad things we all have trials, we all have pain right? there's an old gospel song about that. yeah yeah, you're right, and, and you said uh, without it, you know, basically we wouldn't be as close to God. Uh, I think it was the Dalai Lama who said, I love suffering, it brings me closer to God. That's kind of an interesting uh, thought. Yeah, go ahead, Rhonda. Well, as you started out tonight, it doesn't always bring people closer to God. Sometimes people get angry with God, and mm. they get against God, and they blame God. Mm. Yeah, and where is God in that? Where yeah. is God? Mm -hmm. What has happened? Did God care about my child? Mm -hmm. And in a very practical sense, yes, we can say, explain to them that uh, God created people with free choice. Mm -hmm. okay? But I think that if we do not embrace the belief that there is a Satan and there are demonic forces in the world, then you can't explain it, and you can't make, this doesn't make any sense. Suffering in the world, to me, makes no mm -hmm. sense unless we understand that there is a very real Satan, mm -hmm. and that he is very destructive, and he's in this world, mm -hmm. and he's So something that I've realized, Rhonda, and, and yes, thank you for bringing that up. I've heard a lot of people say things like that, and um, is that uh, different things bring comfort in different ways to people. Um, so there's a lot of ways, again, to kind of answer this problem. We haven't addressed them all tonight. Um, and it's all contextual. It all depends on the situation. So I mean, um, Again, like in my example, when I didn't get the scholarship to go to school, but my, you know, eventually that suffering turned out for something better, um, I can then look back and say, like Joseph with his brothers, well, what was meant for evil, God turned it around for good. So that brings me comfort. The issue is, is that when I hear someone suffering, I don't really know their pain. Only God knows their pain. And so for me to say something like, well, God's going to turn that around for good, right? Your four-year-old, your example you gave was a, a four-year-old was, was uh, sexually assaulted, um, right? Your, your four-year-old was sexually assaulted. God's going to turn that around for good. You see how that, that doesn't work coming from the, 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 the hearer's mouth? It has to be from the person who experienced it. Uh, so that's really key, uh, just, just so you all you know, know that. But but yeah, so Rhonda mentioned that, you know, for her, what makes the most sense is there's got to be a force of evil in this world that, that you can understand suffering. There's just some stuff in this life that is so evil, like, you know, a sexual assault of a, a small child, that it's just so mind boggling. You know, I think uh, war does that to a lot of people. Um, after, you know, the world went through World War I and then World War II and then, you know, Vietnam, it's a lot of people that's just like, it just blows our mind. You know, you hear stuff on the news, you see stuff, and it's just these unthinkable kind of tragedies like that. Um, and and for, for a lot of people, knowing, again, that that's not God, but that responsibility is placed on uh, someone else, uh, often the scripture says the enemy or, or, or Satan, the accuser, um, brings comfort to a lot of people. Other people may say, well, that's not good enough. Um, uh, yeah. 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 Right. Right. That one day evil is going to be destroyed. Yeah. Yeah. All of it, including Satan. Yeah. Mm. Mm. You bring up a hard, another hard pill to swallow. Uh, Fran said that. You know, God's ultimate purpose for us is for us to be like Jesus and look at Jesus and see what happened to him and all the suffering he went through. Um, and, and, and so, again, it goes back to Hick's kind of perspective on evil and suffering is that uh, what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. What doesn't kill us makes us more like Christ. 
Um, and I, I do think there is some merit to that, um, that yes, that, that some of that suffering can be used for good. The, the issue that I hear raised a lot of times is that, well, that suffering wasn't worth it, or I can't see how that made me any better. Um, so you, again, it's got to be contextual, right? Because, you know, I, I didn't name them all, but I know of at least seven reasons for suffering. So uh, innocent mistake, lack in judgment, uh, evil in the world, uh, suffering that produces righteousness or some kind of betterment. You know, th those are all different reasons. So, you know, if, if the reasons are different, then again, our answer in some ways has to take a, a little bit of a different shape. Um, so, you know, sometimes that suffering, you're right, it's, it's to bring us closer to God or to make us more like Christ. Other times, you know, Rhonda, kind of what you brought up, sometimes it's just so evil, it's hard to see how that could, could help us, you know, be made in the image of Christ. So again, there's, there's tension, there's tension, but I like it, I like the conversation. I, I see who is first, we're going to go up front and then we'll go back. Um, well, so far we've been talking a lot about evil Yeah. But there are some things that you can't assign blame to evil, like childhood cancer or yeah. any cancer. Yeah. Um, COVID-19. So is that just the result of a fallen world mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. everything mm -hmm. has just gone away from paradise? And then we have to kind of accept that and wait? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that's a, a, a question fully formed, but I'm going to try to rephrase it for everybody to hear if it was just a comment. But basically, the, again, it's hard to assign all the suffering that we see as evil with a capital E. For example, natural disasters, um, hurricanes, wildfires, earthquakes, uh, you know, cancer, COVID, those types of things. Uh, so you brought up the common uh, answer to that is, well, we live in a fallen world. Because of sin, when sin entered into the world through Adam and Eve's sin, uh, everything has been corrupted because of that. It's kind of like this ripple effect. You throw a stone into the river, and the waves have just kept rippling, rippling out into eternity until Jesus stops the waves. Um, so yes, that is one uh, way of looking at it. Um, and then you had a question, are we just supposed to wait around till Jesus comes back to solve that? They're also kind of lessons. Yeah, they're also kind of lessons. Because Let me address. Some are hard lessons to learn and to swallow. Yeah. But by seeing what is happening, you can say, well, wait a minute. I can change that situation. Yeah. I change my yeah, a lot of it's our, our perspective, right? You know, suffering in a lot of ways is our perspective. What looks like suffering for me, not getting my scholarship, is not suffering to someone in a third world country <laughs> um, who grew up with no clean water and, you know, half the village has HIV, right? I mean, that, those are two very different types of suffering, and a lot of it is your perspective. I, I agree with you. But, but yeah, and are we just supposed to wait around for Jesus to come back? Um, in some ways, yes. Um, in some ways, no. I think that, that God's power is working even now for our good. And that's that Romans 8, 39 promise that in all things God is working together uh, good for those who love him. And you see that all over scripture. So I don't think God is a hands-off God who's just like, well, I'm not going to do anything about it till this point in time. He, he did something in the person of Jesus and through Jesus and through his church and go back to the church cooperating with Jesus, he is doing something. The difference, and I wish we had more time for this, but uh, the, Jesus' power, God's power doesn't look like human power. When we try to take things into our own hands, again, going back to yanking out the weeds, we do it with human strength and military might, if you will. Um, how Jesus was expected to come is a great example of this. He was expected to come as a mighty king on a horse who is going to take back Jerusalem, who is going to free them from Roman oppression, who is going to sit on the literal throne that Caesar was sitting on. And that's not what happened. And people were disappointed because what he did is he rode in on a donkey 
then dragged his feet on the ground, um, and people were waving branches that they climbed up palm branches to get, and uh, then he died. He, he took a very different throne, right? And he did it through sacrificial love and selflessness. And so God's love dealing with evil doesn't look like a big stick, right? It's not how we would want God to do it a lot of times. It's the, and, and if you go back and read Matthew 13, I know we're over time, so we got to close. Um, but stay around if you want to, and I'll answer questions, but I'm going to leave everyone for dinner. But read the rest of Matthew 13. He talks about the kingdom of heaven and how uh, the kingdom of heaven is like a little bit of yeast that's put into flour, that a woman puts into flour, and she bolds it around, and that yeast goes through the whole bread, right? And then it rises, right? So that's what the reign and rule of God, of justice and peace and love, looks like. It doesn't look like, boom, there it is. It's here, it's among us now, it started with the birth of Christ, and ever since, it's growing in the world. His love is growing. His justice is growing. Every time you see a, a, a hungry person get fed, every time you see love, every time you see forgiveness win the day, every time you see captives or, or people that are oppressed go free, that's God's love breaking in. And so that's the kind of love that God has. I, I, got, I wish I could answer it more fully, but I got to move on. I'm going to try to do one more question, maybe if it's quick. I don't know, and then I'm going to pray. Okay, make a comment, and I'll repeat it, and then I'll pray. I don't know if everyone here, but again, kind of back to that, that struggle with it's hard for me to see that my suffering is producing uh, goodness or, or being like Christ because there's a lot of people out there in the world that are not in America, that are not in Venice, Florida, that are not of my social economic status, that are suffering way, way, way more than I am. And when I look at my life and get that perspective, it's, it's hard for me to, to really think about my suffering in that lens anymore. And honestly, yeah, I'm right with you. If you've never been on a missions trip, please go on a missions trip. Uh, it does more for you maybe than it even for the people there because it's a, it's a culture shock and you realize I, I don't really have it that bad, um, which is a, a big part of this conversation too. Um, I'm going to close in prayer. I'll hang out for questions. Uh, I'll see you all at dinner later. Good and gracious, almighty, all-knowing Father God, you are love. Scripture confirms that. However, we know there are things in this world that do not represent your love. And it is difficult as believers who walk by faith and not by sight. When we see the suffering of evil, our hearts cry out for justice, for mercy, for peace and for suffering to stop. And I believe that, that that is your heart, God, that that is your cry, that that is your prayer, that one day evil will stop. But Lord, in the, in the meantime, help us to trust. Help us to trust that you are good, that your mercies are new every morning, and that your goodness is right here with us, even now. Help us to not always be the fixers, uh, but to rely on your grace. And help us to spread that good news so that when those who are suffering in this age ask us questions and they want to know why are things the way they are, Give us grace to, to answer their questions with wisdom and with your truth, but also help us to realize that there is a questioner behind that question and that the most important thing we can do is be Jesus to them, who did not 
answer all our questions, but instead gave us himself. And he gave himself fully, even to the point of death on the cross, and he entered into our suffering with us so that we could know that we are not alone, that God sees us, he's with us, he feels our pain, he knows it better than anyone else because he went through it. And so we can trust that a God who would give his life for us is indeed coming back to save us as he promised. It's in his name we pray, amen. Oh, bless the food, dear Lord and bless us as your servants in this world. Amen. Amen.